and you can figure out my age <laughs> from that day. Yeah. Uh, what war were you in and what branch of the service did you serve in? I was inducted or enlisted in the, into originally the National Guard and that was activated into the Army. And this was in World War II? World War II. Prior to World War II. And what was your highest rank? First Lieutenant. Lewis, were you drafted or did you enlist? I, I enlisted in the National Guard. Do you remember the year? Uh, let me explain first that I believe it was September 1940 that there was a draft and there was an, and that I, the lottery was a national lottery in Washington, D.C. And uh, I received what they would have considered a low number because that's the way it was set up. And when I got my number in the lottery, I knew that I was going to be uh, called into the service rather early. And so after consultation with my my father, we decided to join the National Guard, which was also uh, um, having uh, a year of service, and that I would join the National Guard, do my service, and that would be it, and go with the local National Guard, and I know the people locally. So that's what I did, and uh, I, for the first couple of months, I used to attend the weekly drills at the local armory. And lo and behold, the uh, National Guard was federalized, and I being a part of the 169th Infantry, which was a part of the 43rd Division, was ordered to active duty with the Army. And uh, immediately uh, I had to put on my uniform and, and, and uh, before leaving New Britain we uh, I used to report at the local armory and drill all day and then allow, uh, allow amount to go home at night. And we did that until early March, when we entrained for Camp Landing, Florida. Now, where were you living at the time that you were enlisted in the National Guard? In New Britain. New Britain, Connecticut? Right. Are you a New Britain native? Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you know the, remember the date, or, or at least the year that uh, the National Guard was federalized and you got your orders to active duty? I, I just mentioned it. I had already mentioned a few. What was that year? Well, I know you joined the well, National Guard in 1941. I believe it was January or, the, or, or February that the, uh, the Guard was uh, federalized. Oh. And you were, uh, had you done any basic training? Yes, ma'am. We used to go every morning down to Willowbrook Park in New Britain. And we used to do a lot of close order drill and uh, very uh, minute, I might say, maneuvers that the, uh, the park was able to uh, accommodate. And we did that most of the day and then went back up, marched back up to the armory and there was, we were dismissed for the, for the day and for our, to our homes. And we were to report back the next morning again to the Army to start the next day's activity. Now, you said you were sent to Camp, what was that? Blanding. Camp Blanding, Florida. B-L-A-N-D. Right. In fact, the whole 43rd Division went there. And what did you do there? 
Well, there we started uh, after that. We were at that time part of the a part of the army. We started out basic training. We went through a series of basic training, uh, which was early in '41, and then we were sent to Louisiana for maneuvers. How and long were you uh, in basic training at Camp Landing? Well. Uh, I would say about three months, basic training, and there we went to Louisiana for maneuvers, which extended for three months, the maneuvers. Wow. We went to what was called the Kasachi National Forest. And our base was called Dry Prong, Louisiana. And there we became part of the Third Army. And the basic we, training must have been pretty easy for you after you'd already done a lot of that up here in New Britain. Well... Was it different? Uh, it was more intensive. If you went with your whole division, you must have gone down with a lot of guys you knew from your hometown. Mostly until the uh, draftees. We were not a full company at the time. I was part of an I company of the 169th uh, Infantry Regiment. And uh, we were filled in by draftees, mostly Southerners, and uh, filled in the ranks uh, until we had a full complement. What was uh, your experience like with your maneuvers in Louisiana? When you had three months of maneuvers, what kinds of things did you do? Uh, we did a lot of uh, hiking in swamp-like territory. Uh, it was not exactly easy because uh, we were on the go all the time. We even traveled uh, as part of the maneuvers uh, many miles per day. And uh, sometimes uh, because of the, uh, the time of the year down in Florida, uh, we became very thirsty and uh, we sometimes drank local water, which we probably shouldn't have. But because of necessity, we, we we did. Did you get sick at all? From no, we did not get sick, thankfully. Where did you go from Louisiana? From Louisiana, by that time, it got to be towards September of 1941. And they sent us to the Carolinas for further maneuvers. And say we, and we maneuvered between North Carolina and South Carolina, up and down both states. And finally, by the, by the end of November, we had completed the maneuvers and we went back to Camp Landing, Florida. It wasn't hardly a week after we'd gotten back that the uh, war was declared on December 7th. Do you remember where you were when you heard that war was declared? I heard it. I was flat on my back doing what they call bunk fatigue, which was on a Sunday, as I recall. You know, after uh, our extended uh, maneuvers, we were a little bit tired, and we thought we'd catch up on a little of what we called, as I, as I just said, bunk fatigue. So you were you were in your bed taking a nap? Right. You remember your reaction when you heard that Pearl Harbor had been bombed? Well, well, it was hard to believe, but we accepted it. And some of them, some of my uh, uh, buddies, really took it very hard. And uh, they really felt very badly about, about it. But I took it rather philosophically 
and, and uh, reading the papers of what was going on in, in, in Europe and, and so forth, that it looked like to me that war would be inevitable. And so I just tried to make the best of it. And where did you go from there? From there, after a while, the higher command decided that they would move the entire division from Camp Landing to Camp Shelby, Mississippi. And so, by convoy, with all the equipment that we had and all the baggage and, and uh, personnel, we drove from Camp Landing across the state of the Panhandle of Florida through Alabama and, land and, and came to Camp Shelby, Mississippi. Did you have a specific job assignment? Yes. What was it? I started out originally as a private with the rifle company, but they asked me to uh, uh, join the uh, weapons platoon of the uh, company, and, uh, and I became a gunner for the 60 millimeter mortar. Where did you do your training for that? At Camp Shelby. We did not have any uh, uh, equipment. We used sticks for mortars because we, we did not have the actual weapon. And so I did become a corporal there and I commanded, or so-called commanded, uh, the, the squad, the uh, mortar squad. Can you tell me about the mortar guns? Well, the mortar... What do you call them? Weapons? It's a real weapon. It, it uh, fires a 60 millimeter shell, and it's just a tube. And you drop the shell, it is a shell, down the tube, and it uh, is fired upon contact. And uh, uh, it's used mostly for short range targets to accompany to accompany the, uh, the infantry and um, it had what they called a, a, a site that you used to uh, that was attached to the mortar to uh, target poss uh, target uh, find targets and estimate the range and using that sight, we estimated the range and and uh, fired the weapon. And how many men did it take to operate that? It actually uh, it actually only took two men. Actually, you could have a third that would uh, handle ammunition, but the two men would be ne only necessary. One person carried the tube. The other. Uh, uh, person carried the so-called base plate, as it was called, and that's all it took to carry. Which and, did you carry, or you alternated? Well, I was being a, a corporal. I didn't have to carry anything. Oh, how is that? He's... I I only carried my own weapon, personal weapon, and uh, I had two men carry the. Uh, the, the weapon and the base plate. So you would oversee them setting it up if you were going to actually use it? Absolutely. That's exactly what my duty was to uh, use the site to uh, estimate the range. So that was part of your job to site it in? Site it in and, uh, and the uh, gunner would, uh, would adjust the, the uh, weapon for the range and then the uh, other person would be the, handle the ammunition, that is the shells for the tube. So was most of your training at Camp Shelby in the use of the mortar? Yes. And then where did you go from there? Well, from there, uh, after finding a notice uh, in the uh, company's headquarters that they uh, we're looking for possible candidates, for officer candidates. 
I decided that I was going to apply to officer candidate school. And I did apply to the quartermaster corps for Why a commission. Why did you choose the, the quartermaster corps? Well, because of my civilian experience. Which was I was in the wholesale uh, grocery business, and I, I uh, knew the distribution of food, and, uh, and that was a part of the one of the functions of the quartermaster corps. I appeared before a quartermaster board, a division board of, of at least a half a dozen officers, and, and uh, it took first time I did not uh, pass the the uh, the board. They asked me questions that I couldn't answer, and I said I I don't know because I was in the infantry, not the quartermaster corps. But they applied. But I applied a second time at a, at a, at a, a future uh, occasion, and uh, I was accepted. And. Uh, I went to officer candidate school in the September of 42. And was that still at Camp Shelby or was that? No, I was sent to, to, for quartermaster uh, officer training at Camp Lee, Virginia. How and long did that training last? I was what they called a 90-day wonder. Oh, I've heard about those guys. What was the training like? Well, it was a mixture of uh, military training and uh, quartermaster tactics. Uh, and that is uh, supply uh, training and also military training. And uh, while I was there, in as much as I had infantry training, most of them had been in the quartermaster corps, the other cadets, as we were called. I was I was uh, asked to uh, to be in charge of bayonet training for for the uh, cadet class. Did you know anything about using the bayonet? I learned the bayonet when I was in the infantry, and I knew how to use it. And I and I told them we trained in the military training, and I showed them the use of the bayonet. And I, I later, I later became an adjutant to the commander of the cadet corps, and uh, I, uh, I helped the commander. I helped. I was ordered to. Um, uh, I was ordered by the commander to uh, assemble the cadet corps, and and. Uh, and turn it over to the uh, commander of the cadet corps. That was my job as adjutant. Wow. Uh, and this was all in your 90-day stay there? Exactly. So you didn't even use your mortar training for anything? No. No. After your 90 days, where did you go? After my 90 days, I got my commission. What's that mean? Well, I was, uh, they had a ceremony where it was like a graduation exercise where you were handed your commission and you were, you could wear your uh, gold bars as a, as a brand new second lieutenant. And I was ordered to, uh, uh, as a 10 day delay en route to Camp Devons, Massachusetts, where I was, or where I uh, had a uh, baker's and cook's course, in, uh, and where I did mess management. And in the meantime, I got married. While, 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 in between uh, the ten days, right, right. Did you come home to New Britain to get married? Yes, I did. On your 10 days? Yeah, on my 10 days, right. I, I was uh, married in New Britain. What was the date? Uh, November the 15th of 42. 
when you went, then you went on to Camp Devens, Massachusetts. Yeah, 30 day course. It was a 30 day course in baking and cooking? Right, the mess management. So you learned to... How to handle, how the company, uh, they called it the meals, they called it a mess. The company mess, that's all. But that was not very difficult. That was the, that was very easy. In all of your training prior to this and up at Camp Dennis, do you remember any of your instructors? Uh, not really, no. They were not, they, they weren't any of the, the outstanding that I could remember. Now, by the time you're at Camp Evans, you probably are not with a lot of your hometown buddies anymore? No more. I was strictly on my own. Where did you go after your 30 days at Camp Back Devens? to Camp Lee, what they called a replacement depot. In other words, a pool. And awaiting orders to be assigned to some unit. And I did become assigned to How a unit. How long did you wait? Oh, perhaps 30 days. And what unit did they assign you to? They assigned me to a unit in Camp Atterbury, Indiana. The 249th Quartermaster Battalion. That was Camp Atterbury? Atterbury. Atterbury? A-T-T-E-R-B-U-R-Y. Camp Atterbury, Indiana. And that's where I was assigned, it was a uh, black outfit, all black. Did you know that when they assigned it to you? No, I did not know it till I arrived there. What was your reaction? Well, my attitude always was to accept whatever came my way, whatever it happened to be. Black or white, it made no difference to me. So you were then to become the officer of this battalion? I was one of the officers because I was only a shave tail second lieutenant. I did not command the company. Oh. So how big of a group of men were you in charge of? Well, I was in charge of a platoon. How, how many men in a platoon? Oh, the platoon was probably uh, 50 or 75 men. So what did you do while you were at Camp Atterbury? Basic training. Infantry basic training, which was familiar to me. And were you getting trained or were you training the men? I was training the men. They were, they were absolutely green. They had had no training? They had no training. Were they all uh, enlisted or drafted? All in the, well, the draftees mostly. All draftees. And that's when we got after, oh, more than 30 days that we got orders already to go overseas. You would only had 30 days of training them? That's all. That's all. We didn't have not very much training. Do you think they were ready to go? Well, they weren't, they, these troops were not combat troops. These are the 249th was uh, um, a service battalion. What service meant, in the, as far as army is concerned, is labor. In other words, they were to be used as labor troops, not combat troops. That's why it wasn't so essential that they had further uh, basic training and been going overseas. So I, they appointed me the Advanced Task Force Officer. And I was sent on my own to Staten Island, New York to arrange for the equipment of my unit to be available to go with the unit when we went overseas, fully equipped. That meant vehicles and arms, for, for, the, for the men as well, and whatever was necessary 
for the support of the unit. At that point, did you know where you were going to be going overseas? Absolutely not. We had absolutely no, no knowledge where we were going. So you knew you were going overseas to be in support of some fighting unit? Well, we didn't know we could have been in, gone, sent to uh, England, as a matter of fact, or, or Africa. We didn't, didn't know where we were, we were going to be sent. So after you set things up in Staten Island, New York, did you go back to Atterbury? No, I just waited for my unit to join me in Staten Island. And did you ship out from New York? We shipped out of Staten Island from there and got onto a ship and uh, we went to North Africa. When did you find out you were going to North Africa? Oh, after we were on board and after, on, the way over. on the way over. Do you remember the date? I think it was in May, I think it was. May of, uh, 40, of 43. Where did you land in North Africa? We landed in Oran. And that's where we are introduced to the Arabs. And we saw these Arabs dressed entirely strange costumes that we never, none of us ever saw before. What did the Arabs and that, and, and I'd just like to say at this point that uh, for security reasons we were not, we were not allowed to write home where we were going. And I, I, I says, and I wrote, I remember writing a letter that I was in one of the lands close to Abraham. They didn't know where that could be, most anywhere where Abraham was. And, uh, and I, that's, that's the only way I could get by the censors. How long did you stay in Iran? Oh, not very long. Uh, there was like a staging area Iran was. And they put us on the trucks, and the whole unit was shipped to Algiers. By truck? By truck. Convoy. And what did you do in Algiers? Well, when we got to Algiers, my men were probably, uh, I was separated from my unit, and they sent me as a docks officer in the port of Algiers. My men were probably doing uh, labor uh, tasks at uh, various warehouses uh, in the environs of Algiers. My job at the port of Algiers was to oversee the uh, unloading of uh, supplies uh, for uh, lend-lease to the French in the uh, Algiers area. And my job was to hire, believe it or not, stevedores, Arab stevedores, not uh, uh, soldiers, but uh, American soldiers, but uh, Arab stevedores that worked for a stevedore company at the port. And uh, when a ship came into port with supplies, with lend-lease supplies, I was to assign X number of uh, stevedores for unloading the cargo of, of, of these uh, uh, ships. And I used some of my men to ride shotgun on these trucks with supplies going to warehouses in, in Algiers and surrounding areas because uh, they had to guard the, the, the contents of the truck because of the pilferage by uh, the, the natives. Now, where were the ships coming from? From the right. States. Oh, from the United States? Right. Getting supplies over to Algiers? Exactly. And then you were getting the supplies to exactly. the warehouses? Exactly. And that was to supply the American soldiers? Right. 
No, no, supplied to the French. Oh. Mostly for the French, free French, they call. Oh. And uh, I was uh, given uh, permission to live in Algiers on my own in the so-called residence uh, uh, hotels. I stayed in one in, in, the, in the city of Algiers with another officer in Algiers. I did not, uh, was not with, with the troops at the time. How long were you in Algiers? Oh, for several months. Now, during that period, did you see your men on a regular basis, or were you no. always at the docks and they were in the warehouse? Exactly. I was at the docks. I had no contact, um, close contact with my uh, company. What was life like living in Algiers? Well, not too bad. I got acquainted with some of the uh, local people and and uh, invited to dinner sometimes. And, uh, well, that's about it. They were uh, able to drive around the countryside a little bit. Uh, I, I had the services of a Jeep in my uh, possession so that I was able to do that. And so it wasn't uh, bad at all. And where did you go from Algiers? From there, I rejoined the company and uh, drove by train, believe it or not, by train to Bizerti. And what did you do there? And there we bivouacked uh, outside of Bizerti awaiting the uh, um, the invasion we did not know but it was Sicily did you know something was up we knew that I knew something was up because uh, at the same time that I was down in the port of Algiers I was combat loading ships for a possible invasion somewhere and I happened to be combat loading the ship that uh, General Patton was on, who was commanding, who was commanding the whole uh, expedition. Did you actually see General Patton? I did see General Patton. Down in Algiers? In Algiers, down in the dock area. And what ship was, were you loading for him? I'm loading the ship was called the Monrovia. That must have been quite an experience. Well, it's the first time I we combat loading is a little different because you you load the supplies according to the way you would like the uh, supplies to be unloaded. Uh, certain classes of supply had priority. So, what kinds of things would they want unloaded first? Tanks and, and weapons, artillery, jeeps, trucks, ammunition. That that was those were the things that would have priority. After that would come uh, food and clothing. So that's the way it went in. First food and clothing, then the others with, with the top deck uh, loaded with. Uh, tanks and uh, weapons and and uh, vehicles. So, Bizerti, how long were you there before the invasion? Oh, not very long, possibly maybe a week or two weeks at the most before the and invasion. They loaded you on ships. They loaded us onto what they called an LST, which was uh, short for landing ship tank. And uh, and we finally learned where we were going at that time. We landed in Sicily at two ports. No, it wasn't a port. The, the landing was at Jela and Licata. Jela, how do you spell G -E -L -A. it? G-E-L-A. 
and Licata, L-I-C-A-T-A. That's one, one, one word. word? One word, Licata. And that's where you disembarked? That's where we disembarked. And then what did you do? And uh, they, uh, they had me forming a convoy because of, I did not land there D-Day. I was there several days, we arrived several days after D-Day. Uh, they had me form a convoy to go to Palermo. And so forming the convoy, we, I took the convoy to Palermo at night under blackout conditions. I'd never been there before, so I just had to uh, be very careful. I didn't lead the convoy astray, because I was in the lead truck. Oh, good heavens. So that's a, quite a responsibility in a country you've never even been in before? Exactly. Of course, the Army stationed uh, personnel at various points to make sure you stayed on the road. Did you make it to Palermo? We made it to Palermo. No incidents on the way? No incidents. No incidents. And, and we arrived in Palermo, and uh, we were set up in a, an area, a bivouac area, in Palermo. And how long did you stay there? Well, Palermo, we stayed a little while, but I didn't, I didn't stay uh, with, um, there in Palermo. I did stay some time, but mostly I was sent with my platoon up the coast. Uh, I'm, I forgot the name of the uh, town on the coast on the way uh, that we set up a class three supply point, which is gasoline and petroleum. The gasoline supply point was, was uh, occupied by my platoon and we dispensed gasoline and oil to all the uh, trucks and uh, other vehicles like tanks or uh, the personnel carriers with the uh, gasoline in five gallon cans. Everything was in five gallon cans. They're called bidons. Bidons? Yeah, I think it's spelled B-E-A-D-O-N-S. Five gallon cans anyway. It must have taken a long time to fill a tank well, with five gallons. Well, they carried, they filled them up that way, and they carried them extra uh, strapped to the sides of the vehicle, you know, so they had extra uh, gasoline with them. And the units used to come and, and, and fill, get the bead on, and uh, they didn't fill it right there. They take it with them and and uh, and um, they, uh, they fill their tanks where, wherever they were going. But we were supplying them with the gasoline. That was my job. And how long did you do that? I really can't say. I, I've forgotten already. Time <laughs> uh, went by. And in the meantime, the uh, landing was made at Salerno, Italy, after Sicily. Yeah. And how did that affect you? Well, uh, it affected us that we knew that we were not a part of the assault on this invasion, but we would be available for future assaults or future landings as time went by. We didn't know when or where, but this time we did, we, we, it wasn't our responsibility for the assault on Salerno. And so after the landings, uh, we we left Sicily by convoy up the coast again for, uh, um, to Messina. What were your du duties at Messina? We did not stay at Messina. We, we crossed the straits on barges and uh, arrived in Reggio, which is part of Calabria. And we proceeded again by convoy up the boots, 
so to speak. And we approach the Naples area. Did you stay in Naples? We did not stay in Naples, but we stayed uh, in, in uh, near Caserta. Caserta happens to be the uh, residence, the uh, residence of the of the king of Italy, and there was a castle uh, there as well. What did you do in Caserta? Uh, waiting for an assignment. And from there, we moved across the Volturno, where they had been fighting, and, and went further up, and we arrived at a place called Venafro. And my men were, were assigned to various supply points along the way. I did not, was not able to uh, be with them because they were scattered. So in your whole trip up through Italy, as you went, they were assigning your men to different places on yes. the way? Yes, yes. But when I got to Venafro, which was the furthest point north, which was opposite Casino, we were in, I, was, I remember being in the vicinity of a long range artillery unit. They, they're called 155 millimeter long toms. And they used to fire, especially when we were trying to sleep at night. But we didn't stay there too long because the uh, front was stabilized and they were looking for means of trying to break the stalemate. And so they sent us back to the Naples area and we were preparing for an amphibious landing. We knew that that was going to be up the coast. So we stayed there for, for a, a few days. May have, might have been a week or 10 days, for a matter of fact. But in the meantime, uh, we were practicing. It was the first time that our, our men was really concerned about security and they gave us some 50 caliber machine guns and we practiced firing them out into the, off the coast, how to handle a, 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 a weapon like the 50 caliber machine gun. Now, how many men were left in your platoon if you had been losing them a lot? Well, they, they, I might say they, re, they were recalled back to the unit and the unit was uh, reformed again. So you were back up to all the same yes. guys you started Yes, with? exactly. And did that amphibious landing take place? That amphibious landing took place on January the 22nd of 44. And we had been loaded onto another LSD which had been converted to a baby black tub a baby, uh, what are they called, uh, a, a landing uh, ship. Uh, they had a deck. A Higgins they, boat? No, it was a Higgins, it was a, no, it was a Higgins boat, but they put a deck onto it so that uh, small airplanes could uh, take off from there. Flat top, that's the word. A baby flat top. So you were all on that? All on that, and we had some of these Piper Cubs, which were uh, artillery uh, spotters for the artillery. And when we arrived at Anzio for the landing, these Piper Cubs took off and uh, used to spot targets for the artillery. And they just could not land back on the flat on the uh, on the boat but had to land on an airfield which had just been uh, taken by our forces and we landed as quartermaster troops we landed d-day on at anzio and we sustained a few casualties some 
because we landed close to the shore and some of them got drowned and some of them got hit by shrapnel uh, from artillery and, and so forth. So we, we landed at, uh, at Netuno, which is adjacent to An Antio. And at that point, I took command of the, my uh, uh, platoon and tried to find a place where we could uh, set up uh, a headquarters of, of some sort. And we, we drove to Antio, and we found an abandoned artillery barracks. And we set up our headquarters there. But it turned out that that was not a, 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 for, a, a, a fortunate place to be because we were being constantly shelled and bombed by the enemy at that, at that point. And so we decided to get underground as much as possible and we found a nearby uh, farm with a wine cellar where we stayed underneath quite a bit of, uh, we got a bit of protection because uh, it was un under underground. Now this was probably the first combat that your troops had seen? Exactly. How did they react? Well, they used to try to write letters back home and I was the company censor uh, for the mail and they used to say, I was under, under constant fire and I was being shelled and bombed. And that's the one thing we are not supposed to do is to disclose military activity in writing letters. And I had to uh, strike it all out in, in their letters back home. So a good many of them wanted to show that they were really part of the, part of the action. But actually, they were, because they were under constant fire, like, like the, everybody else. Well, was this your first combat also? Yes, it was. Well, and that subsequently, ex excuse me, cut subsequently, we had to prepare a defensive perimeter because we had been warned that we might be subject to uh, attack by uh, uh, airborne uh, infantry of the enemy. They, they might attack us uh, that way. And so we had to set up a defensive perimeter for our unit. And that's where we used our 50 caliber machine guns. But fortunately, it never happened. But my men were under a lot of fire. But I was detached from the unit at that point and, uh, and transferred to a rail, what they call a railhead company. A railhead company's task was to set up and to operate uh, supply points. And I was attached to this railhead company, the uh, class one or food supply point for Anzio. And my job was to go out to the, uh, uh, we, we called them ration dumps, where the food came in uh, from, from the, uh, the amphibious boats that we had coming into Anzio and bringing in all the food and supplies uh, for, the, for the campaign. And uh, it wasn't exactly uh, an easy task because I had my men also were working at the supply, uh, un unloading these uh, vehicles that brought the supplies in. And uh, I was the white officer with all these blacks, but it didn't make any difference. They were men, so they were a soldier just like everybody else. And the only other black personnel they were in an officer capacity was a chaplain that we had. Do you remember his name? Uh, no, I don't remember his name, unfortunately. How did the black soldiers feel having a white officer? You were the only white man there? That is, the, the officers were all white. And... Uh, 
they they took it naturally without any uh, fuss or or uh, any kind of objection. They just accepted it. That's the way it was in the army, and that's it. And the officers did the same as well. Where did you go from there? How long were you there? Well, uh, I was the second lieutenant at that time. Oh, when did you get promoted? Uh, I got promoted, uh, let's see, not, not at Anzio, no. I was still a second lieutenant, and there was a there was a policy at that time in the th uh, theater, as we called it, the area, that uh, one could be rotated back to the states if he had served overseas for a year, and they had two rosters for enlisted men and for officers, and I became the appointee, so to speak, for the one to go from the officers. If uh, on rotation back to the states, so while we were at Anzio, I was selected to go back to the states on a, on rotation. Did that because mean you go back home for good or, or just for no, a while? No, no, just back? just to rotate back to the states, not not out of the service. That was just from overseas back to the, to the states. That's all. So did you get to go then? I did get to go. And I was sent to, by way of uh, Naples, I was not going to take a ship to Casablanca because of the uh, submarine menace in the Mediterranean, and I flew to Casablanca. At Casablanca, I was supposed to wait for surface transportation back to the States. This is all on my own because uh, I was on rotation, I'm under orders. But no ships seem to be coming into Casablanca, uh, so they're going back to the state. So they said, you can, we'll issue orders for you to fly. They sent me up to a place called Port Leote, which is on the uh, northwestern coast of Africa, uh, near, uh, near the uh, uh, Tangier and the, the uh, Straits. And uh, so they put me on a plane there for the States by way of Africa and and South America. I went to Dakar by, Dakar by plane and from there across the Atlantic to Belém, Brazil. Belém, Brazil was actually a on the, uh, it was at the mouth of the Amazon, or where the jungle started. And I was dumped, that's the word, for someone who had higher priority. And I, I could not go any further on the plane because somebody took my place. Well, at that point, I was a little bit irate because I said, these people here uh, are stopping people who have had combat experience like I was in the combat zone, I said, we deserve a little better treatment from anybody who was just, uh, just we call these people on the ice cream front. And so they said, they'll expedite my going back. And they did get me out within a couple of days. And I flew to Puerto Rico and from there to Miami. And there I was, I, I, I trained, I went back to Camp Devons to be reassigned. I went back from there to Camp Lee. And at that point, having had combat or so-called overseas experience, uh, they asked me if I would like to teach. He said, I said, why? I said, I, I never was a teacher. He said, well, you were a salesman, weren't you? I said, I certainly was. He said, well, the sales, a salesman makes the best teacher, best teacher. So they, after taking a, a course in teaching, 
uh, they assigned me to the quartermaster school at Camp Lee, Virginia. And I, they, I was assigned to the uh, quartermaster operations division. There I was to teach the operations of the quartermaster corps to classes, non-com, non-commissioned officers and officers. And that's where I spent my time for the balance of the war. I taught officer classes, mostly, and uh, lived nearby, off, off, base. The, off base, and, uh, and, and then and taught at, at the quartermaster school. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Well, uh, in a way, yes, for the for landing at uh, Anzio, and uh, other just uh, um, medals uh, for the theater, theater. But no, no medals. Thank goodness, I was not wounded, not combat wounded, and, uh, and the commendations. I, we, we did not receive any commendations, so that's about the only medals I received that I can say that it was out of the ordinary. I'm going to ask you some questions about the living conditions in life. Yeah. How did you stay in touch with your family? Did you? I did. When I was in the States, I, I, uh, whenever I got a furlough, I, 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 uh, I flew home. When you were overseas, did you stay in touch? Yes, by mail. Yes, I was uh, like I said. I was a, I was a company censor. Does that mean you censored your own letters? Oh, and, uh, Did I, anyone uh, censor yours? No. You just knew what and not to write. Exactly. As an officer, you're expected to do the right thing. What was the food like? Well, food was. Uh, you were on the go for a lot of that time. You I know. You weren't any one place for that long. What I know. Food? Well, uh, most of the time we had what they called uh, uh, sea rations. Well, that that was uh, partially canned, mostly canned foods, and uh, uh, very little fresh. We used dehydrated eggs, and uh, and. For, and uh, um, did not use any local uh, uh, food. So probably most of the times that you were overseas when you were moving it was sea rations? Yeah, and then there were times when, when we, did, we didn't have sea rations. We had what they call K rations. It was like a big chocolate bar when we were traveling. That were you ever in places overseas where there was actually a mess hall? Uh, No, and I didn't uh, have any access to a mess hall. Only company uh, a mess hall. That is a company mess hall. Yes, but not for a whole uh, big unit. A company mess hall. Yes. What about sleeping? Where did you sleep? Well, I was lucky. Mostly, I I was able to sleep on on a cot, except when I was enlisted. Then I slept like the rest of the Privates on the ground. Pup tents. We slept so the even maneuver. You were on a cot and then you were in the field and moving to all those places. Were were you in tents? Oh yes, I, I mean, uh, mostly tents. Yes. And were your men in tents also? Yes. But they didn't get caught. They got the ground. That's right because. Uh, officer status. One of the perks for being Perk. an officer. Yeah, you exactly. Get a real, you get exactly. A cot. I, uh, I had my own sleep. Bought my own sleeping bag. So I, I used my own sleeping bag, which was part of my bedroll. Did you have sufficient supplies? Supplies were sufficient. Yes. Did you yeah. feel pressure or stress? Certain times, yes, especially on Anzio. 
What was the most stressful part about being an officer? Well, I wanted to see that my men uh, that, that I was assigned uh, got the best breaks that they possibly could get. In other words, the accommodations or the food and uh, who, who would, would be the best that they could possibly get. I was concerned about their welfare. How many men did you lose in combat? Did you lose all the men that you lost in combat on Anzio? No, I didn't know that most of them came through. Some of them did get wounded and were killed in, on Anzio because of the nature of the, uh, uh, of the conditions there. We were under constant uh, uh, shell fire and, and, and air attacks as well. We had quite a few air, air attacks. Almost every every night we were, they had air attacks and, and shelled um, by day, and even the Germans fired their biggest uh, guns at us, uh, 240 millimeter uh, cannon and, and, uh, and artillery, the railroad guns that they used, that they would fire from tunnels. Uh, they would make sure that they, after firing these guns, were, uh, were put back into tunnels to protect them. Do you recall how many men you lost from your platoon? I really couldn't say because some of them were in, that I lost. I, I didn't have an accurate count. As the officer, are you the one that was responsible for sending that information home? No, no, that was not higher up. Uh, yeah, that was not my responsibility. Was there anything special that you did for good luck? Uh, good luck. Like rabbit foot, um, a lot of guys have different things that oh, they do oh, for good luck. Oh, uh, no, I did not have anything like that. I didn't. I had some close uh, escapes from, from being hit by artillery, and uh, in that respect, I was lucky. Lucky several times. One time I was at Anzio, forming a, a convoy going back, and I cut caught in an air raid, and I was with another officer, and we were at the port near a, a, a building, and the officer, during this raid, he dived in one side of the building, and I dived into the building on the other side, and after the raid, he got killed, and I came out alive. Another experience, I, I was out on, at a ration dump, and an artillery shell landed Oh, maybe a uh, hundred feet away, and uh, instead of exploding on contact, it uh, it dug a hole in the ground, and I was showered with dirt and debris. So that uh, that must have been pretty scary. Oh, that was pretty scary. That was pretty scary. That was at Anzio too. That was at Anzio, yeah. Did you have any kind of entertainment or recreation? While I was overseas? Yeah. Uh, I think, where was it? In North Africa, I think. You know, and in Sicily. We had some of the big names. Uh, Al Jolson. Was this at a USO show? Oh, no, no. This is out in the field. Out oh, in the really? field. They came out to you? Oh, yeah. They came out to Al Jolson. And what's her name? Uh, that uh, uh, and there were a couple of others besides Al Jolson. Oh, Bob Hope. Bob Hope was so out you there. You got to see Bob Hope. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's that's about it. Yeah. Did you have any R and R while you were overseas? Yes, I did. From Anzio, can you imagine? I was sent back for R and R. And where did I go? Uh, into the Naples, the Naples area. I went to uh, Sorrento and, uh, and uh, the Isle of Capri. How long did you have R&R? &R? Oh, that was only for a couple, two or three days. So That's what did you all. do on the Isle of Capri? Isle of Capri, I went uh, in a little boat and it, went, it was in a water in a cave. 
and uh, that was the, uh, our, the the recreation. They're just riding in a little boat in the, in the cave. That's all. There was another time I did go. I was in Naples. I went to Pompeii. You know the you know the ruins of Pompeii. I went. I saw that. Saw that pretty well. That was the only. That was another time. While we were in you know in the Naples area. Do you have any photographs? I have more photographs. Uh -huh. I have a few of them. Uh, some of them they're just. You want to see one of the, I, Not yet. When, uh, when I turn the tape uh, off, uh, right, okay. Right, if we can make copies, we'll attach them to this record. All right. What did you think of your fellow officers, and what did you think of the soldiers? Well, as far as the officers was concerned, uh, I thought they did uh, well, but not exceptionally well, as far as the officers were concerned. As far as the men were concerned, I think they tried to do the right thing and, 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 and do their job that they were assigned as best they could. Did you become friends or close with any of the officers or the men? Uh, not really. I did not, I didn't, because I did not uh, maintain any friendship after I left the service. Did you stay in touch with any any officers or men the whole time you were in the war? Did you always have the same group of men that you were trained with back in the United States through the whole time until you rotated back home? Well, no. While I was in the, in the National Guard, the infantry, that was one before I became an officer mm -hmm. and after I received my commission. There was the uh, uh, infantry, that was with the National, originally with the National Guard that was federalized. They were mostly the locals. I know some of the locals here. Did you happen to run into any of them when you were overseas? Uh, not really. They went to the Pacific. Uh -huh. The 43rd Division went to the Pacific and I went to the Mediterranean. See, so I didn't see them at all. But I did meet a couple of people when I was in uh, Sicily. And local people, not part of any units, I mean, but just happened to be local people that I knew. From New Britain? From New Britain, again? yes, yes. Just by chance. Did you keep a diary? I, excuse me. I did meet my cousin by design. Where? In Sicily. I had seen him before I had gone uh, overseas. While I was in OCS, I, uh, he was, uh, had been inducted, and he was in a nearby camp in Virginia, and I saw him. Then after, uh, when, uh, when I went overseas in Sicily, I found out that he was in the uh, 45th Division, which went to Sicily, and uh, I found out about the unit he was in, and we got together one time in Sicily, my cousin. Did you keep a journal or a diary? No. Did you stay in touch with any of the men or any officers after you left Sicily? No, Italy? no. How about after the war? No, no. So you finished your service out in the United States teaching the Quartermaster Corps. Yes. Do you recall your last day in service? Uh, oh gosh, it was in September. I'd say a, uh, maybe about the 15th or so. So we're in September. Are we in 1945? Five. And you were discharged from Camp Lee? No. Discharged to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. I had a go to Indian Town Gap to be, uh... Indian Town? Indian Town Gap. That, that's an Army, uh, Army post. I, in fact, I, I hadn't... By that time, I'd already gotten the car. And my wife and I were living in Petersburg, Virginia. And I drove to uh, Indian Town Gap, stayed there a couple of days, got my discharge, and came back, picked up my wife, and drove back to Connecticut. 
That was my next question. What did you do in the days and weeks immediately after your discharge? So you drove back to New Britain, Connecticut? Yes. Did you have a place to stay or live at that time? And when I got here? Yeah. My wife's residence. She lived in Middletown. And what did you do for work after? Well, I was uh, I was in business with my brother and father in the family business. And you had been doing I'm, that before the war? Yes, and I went back to it. What, what business was Wholesale, that? Wholesale, grocery, food distribution. And is that what you did for a career? Yes, that's for how it. how many years? Oh, for 45 to about uh, 68. And we, we dissolved the business at that time. We went out of business. And I retired and when I was at about 70, but I, I went into my own business after our business was dissolved here. We uh, closed the business and, and I, uh, I, I sold uh, cigarettes from my car. I had uh, accounts I used to call on. It was just a business, that's all. And uh, I did that for about five years, and then I retired completely. Have you attended any reunions since the war? Uh, not, not really, no. Because I wasn't uh, part of my 249th Quartermaster Battalion was a part of the Fifth Army in Italy, and in, in, in Sicily it was the Seventh Army. Uh, but then we had no no reunions. Did you join any veterans organizations? Yes, I did. Right. I, I joined the JWV, the American Legion. Do you remember when you joined? Did you join right after the war? No, or years later. Years later. Are you currently a member? Yes, I am. What post? Well, the JWE was post '56. American Legion. I don't know what the New Britain chapter. New Britain. Yeah. Are you active in those organizations? No, no, I'm not. Neither one of them. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Yes, it has. How? Well, I appreciate what the military does, and I'm, and I think that uh, we have to do everything we possibly can to avoid war, because I know what war is. I know what it's like. And if there's any possible way we can achieve our objectives without resorting to war, that has to be pursued. I know that's very simple to, to say. Everybody is against it. But I, I think that's essential. That's my opinion. How did your military service affect your life? Well, I try to make it as little as possible to affect me in as little as possible. I didn't want to be regimented like I was, and I, I wanted to be free to do whatever I wanted to do, and that's subject to uh, any kind of restraint. Do you have any other memorable events or stories that you can recall that you'd like to share? Well, Nothing really stands out. It doesn't stand out, really. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No. No, I, I think I covered it pretty well. Well, I'd like to thank you for your service to our country, and thanks for your interview, Lewis. Thank you.